long bio. <laughs> and that is not who I am. That's not who I am. These two wings on my back, that's who I am. Those two wings represent three things I am obsessed with. What inclusion means to me. What I want for every single one of us. Whether you have a disability or you don't. The freedom for us to be really who we are. Totally ourselves. Not to fit in, but to belong. It's not about accolades, awards and numbers. It's a freedom to be who I need to be. That's where I wear this crazy jacket for the last nine months. The second is to believe in the magic of possibility. And that's what this room is. And the room behind, hi room behind. We all forget there's a whole load of people behind us there. That's not inclusion, hello room behind. The magic of possibility, what's brought up in this room. And lastly, is the freedom to love and to connect. That's what conclusion is. I'm not standing on this stage because of that bio. It's because I am lucky enough that your country taught it to me. The greatest act of inclusion is self-acceptance. None of us can truly include or be inclusive or treat equally other people if we are not accepting of ourselves. If we can't truly be ourselves. Really, you have to absolutely be yourself and have that courage and take all the bits of you, the good bits, the bad bits, the nice bits, the failures. And if you do that, if you love yourself enough and include yourself enough, and that's a hard journey, that is really hard. Every single one of us is uniquely valuable, equally uniquely valuable. Every single one of you has a story worth telling from this stage. Every one of you. It's not just the 14 or 15 of us being here today. Every one of you has. We shouldn't look in awe at other people because actually you are equally as powerful. We all are. None of us better than the other. That's what inclusion is. A journalist asked me just a few hours ago, well, how can we really do inclusion? What are the tricks? What are the top five tips? <laughs> There's no top five tip and it's not rocket science. It's simply, I will treat you as I want to be treated myself. Labels are causing so much problems. They're for packages and for boxes and for jam jars. They are not for people. These identities and labels are dividing us, not making us act collectively together. Our uniqueness is wonderful, but our collective power is extraordinary. And we are just at the cusp of an inclusion revolution. I am telling you now, it's not just in this room, but an inclusion revolution that includes all of us. When I mean all of us, I mean all of us. No more 1.3 billion people being left on the sidelines. Our time is here. Inclusion for all means including all of us in all of our difference. Our call for disability inclusion is not just for disability, it's for human inclusion. For all of us. The world is better when all of our potential is reached, when all of us can contribute equally. That's when our world is better. The only thing that makes any of us the same is that we're different. And yet we war over it. And we kill each other over it. And there are two things that are awful in the world. One is for those of you who are bullied in school, I was, because I was strange looking skin color, I have albinism. But there's one thing worse than being bullied and that's being invisible. Not important enough to see, right? So now the inclusion revolution is here. It's in this room and it's in places all around the world. But once again, the most, the most bravest thing that you will do is own yourself as part of that inclusion revolution. That is your responsibility. The bravest thing I have ever done in my life is not sitting on my CV and it's not around the accolades, it's not around the awards, it's not about the 18 years of work that I've done around disability, no, not at all. It is that two years ago I helped my father die. And very publicly on stages for the last two years, I've allowed my heart be broken. I want you to see that I loved somebody enough that when they died, my heart broke. 
to really accept yourself, you have to be brave enough not to be perfect, not to be a hero, not to have it all sorted, not to have all the answers. He was the man who had a mantra. His mantra was, my daughter, be yourself, be yourself, be yourself. Because everybody else is taken. It is the only thing that you can do superbly on your own. In his death, I found the courage to do something that I had been putting on the long finger, thinking I was too middle-aged to do it. After years of work in the disability business space, I had always wanted to launch a global business campaign on disability business leadership. But everybody told me, not now, it's too late. I always said, well, if they can do it for green, and if they can do it for gender, why can't we not do it for disability? No, Caroline, no, no, no. And the crazy thing about that dream is I wanted to do it on the back of a horse. Rupert, you and I are kindred spirits. And the crazy thing is the vision came to me that I wanted to do it on the back of a horse and I chose to do it in Colombia. I rode a thousand kilometers across Colombia on a horse to tell the world it was important that dreams were important, that every single one of us is entitled to a dream and that the only way that we can really look at the inclusion of people with disabilities in our society if business, the most powerful force on this planet, is part of that conversation. It is not okay for business to say, we don't do disability this year. It's not okay for a la carte inclusion. You cannot be an inclusive company if you do not welcome us all in all of our humanity. That is not okay anymore. And this campaign called hashtag valuable with a heart right in the middle of it was challenging business leadership the biggest leaders in the world to say they care, to put it on their board agenda, to release the resources and not see us as charity. We don't need your sympathy. We need your business. Because funny, people with disabilities in our families, we are also consumers. We have to eat, we have to be clothed, we have to move, and we have talent, and we have contribution, and we have ability, and we have potential. And you know something, as I stand here only two weeks ago, Though I had to remortgage my house to make valuable work and my heart was broken after dad died, it is such a relief to be able to say to you, I will be meeting some of the speakers you've seen here on one of the most important business stages in the world in January in Davos. We have some of the biggest business leaders in the world challenging 500 companies to make this happen. And you'd think that's what was gonna make me happy, but it's not. Actually, what I learned from valuable more than I learned that I still had it in me, that I wasn't too old to make change happen, was what I learned in India in 2001. When I did valuable against all the odds, when everybody told me I was stupid and crazy, and we made it happen, I found myself again. In my father's death, I peeled away all the layers and I became raw and I found out who Caroline really is. Not all the things that she's done, but who she is. Because in this country, in 2001, I had a huge childhood ambition fulfilled. And it was that childhood ambition that set me on the course for an inclusion revolution. I cannot thank this country enough for that. Because it was always a dream for me to become Mowgli from the Jungle Book. From the age that I had seen the Jungle Book at six years old, I wanted to be Mowgli. I wanted to hang out in the jungle, I wanted to hang out in the elephants. And by 17 years old, I wanted to do other things that were about freedom. So I wanted to be Mowgli, and I wanted to be a cowgirl. Well, that was Colombia. And I wanted to do motorbikes. And at 17, I thought I could do everything. But at 17, I was to discover by complete accident, well, maybe not, is that my father gave me one driving lesson. Not that we could have afforded I driven, but he knew that I wanted to drive fast cars and motorbikes. And it was at 17 I found out that I actually was registered blind that I have ocular albinism, that I can't see to the edge of this stage very well, and I don't need to fall today. From my hand, I can't see any of you. I can smell you very well, <laughs> and I can feel you very well, but I can't see you at all. And I've got to say to you, the way I look really young is standing very far away from the mirror. I am the best looking person I can be. My husband, who is bald and very white skinned, thinks, he is the luckiest man in the world because I say he looks like George Clooney, which he does to me. It's true. He's the handsomest man in the world. And you know what? He loves me so much to let me go off around the world. But my sight is much worse than it may seem. And the reason I look so visible or visual 
is that it was no accident I got to 17. My parents discovered my sight when I was six months old and they chose not to tell me. They did not want my life to be made small by a label of disability and they brought me up as a sighted child, gave me a pair of glasses and I thought I could see like any other kid with glasses. And you know something? It's amazing what you can do if you believe you can. And when I found out at 17 that I had this disability and this registered blind thing, you know what? I committed the first act of conscious discrimination of my life, something I have always regretted. I did not want to be disabled because I was fearful that my world would be small and I could not belong. And so I hid it for 11 years. I went through college and became an archeologist, which is a stupid thing for a blind person to do. I actually went to business school, and because I can't see very well, I did brilliantly in my exams and got a first. I ended up in Accenture, one of the biggest management consultancy companies in the world, and they didn't even know I was blind. What does that say for management consultancy? But other than that, I gotta tell you, 11 years pretending you're somebody you're not is so tiring. And after 11 years trying to be perfect, just trying to be perfect, and I was doing really well, I was too tired. I was exhausted. Because this isn't about disability. All of us hold secrets, right? It's really hard to be ourselves. But eventually at 28, I had to because I had damaged my eyes. And in damaging my eyes, Accenture, I went to see them. I told them it was the first time in my life I'd asked for help. And I remember jokingly saying to them, I have to see, I can't see you right now. And they're like, okay, let's reschedule the meeting. I'm like, no, 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 I can't see you right now. So then I go to see a doctor, and the doctor was, Caroline, why is it you are so frightened to be who you are? And what were your dreams when you were younger? And what is stopping you being that woman right now? It's not your eyes, it's the six inches between your ears. And it was that day, nearly, oh my gosh, it's nearly 18 years ago now, or 17 years ago, that I decided I would take time off and fulfill that childhood ambition. And that was to become Mowgli from the Jungle Book. Yeah. And now I'm gonna get really emotional <laughs> because it was the time I was the most frightened in my life. Why are we frightened to be who we are? And I'm more frightened now standing in front of you because you know, it's how many years ago, how I became Mowgli from the Jungle Book was to go to Kerala and have the first blind date of my life, excuse the pun, with an elephant called Kanchi. And Kanchi and I would trek a thousand kilometers through Kerala, Karnataka, and Tamil Nadu. I would become the first and only Western female Mahout elephant handler, for those of you who know Malayalam and Apriana. And, and because I'm Irish Catholic and guilty, I couldn't just do it just for self-discovery. So we raised enough money to pay for 6,000 cataract operations in Coimbatore Hospital. And you know, no, don't clap at that. I'm, the reason I'm saying that to you is, on that elephant, do you know what I learned? Do you know what your country taught me? Do you know what that elephant taught me? You can't go off saving the world, Caroline, if you don't look into yourself. But I learned that people have dreams, particularly people with disabilities, that people say no to, imagine what you are capable of. And when I came off that elephant, everybody said to me, do you, did you want to have a cataract operation? Did you want to have your eyes come back? No. Do you know what I learned? Is that actually my lack of sight was my greatest secret weapon. Who gets to have the dreams come true that I had? And you know what? If I was fully sighted, I guess I'd never have been Mowgli. So when I came off that elephant, when I left this country of yours, you believed in me, you encouraged me to be myself. I set off on an 18 year journey around inclusive business. I cannot thank this country enough for helping me see what I could not see. That in my flawed state, I was my absolute best. And then actually, as I traveled on this elephant, you know what, the greatest impediment was not my sight, oddly, it was my pink skin. And actually, the fact that I was a woman bareback on an elephant, let's be honest. I was some freak of nature. But I want to finish by saying something to you. As I started with hashtag valuable, I hope in a year's time, I hope you will help me get Indian companies to be part of this valuable 500. But I want to go back to this thing about this 
this place where we are right now, this point of inclusion revolution and what it is that we can all do together. Maya Angelou said a beautiful thing. There is no greater agony than an untold story hidden inside ourselves. Tell your story. Every one of you tell your story. Help each other tell your story. Be who you need to be. Please don't compare yourselves to other people. Please. You are the best you you can be. They are not better than you. There is no them and us. You are just perfect the way you are. Let's be the wings for each other. Give each other the permission to be who they need to be. And you are also never defined by a moment of success or a failure or a tragedy overcome or your story or these bios or anything like it. Every day you get a second chance. I've had more failures than you ever even knew. I've had to shut down companies, start up companies, love people, lose people, get divorced, get married. It goes on. Life is a journey. There is no eureka, but you get a second chance every single day of your life. And in the, in the tough bits, and you've heard every story here today, do you know what the magic of people comes out in the cracks? It's the pain, amongst the hard places, that's where you find you, the best you ever, the bit of you that shines brightest than anything else. Don't be frightened of the failure. Dance with it. It's the greatest place that you'll learn. In the tears is the greatest laughter. And lastly, I want you to tell you, never, ever, ever give up on you, on this mission that we are going to create together with hands held high, dancing, singing. This has been an incro incredible day. I feel like I've drunk the Kool-Aid of IIS and I'm coming back next year, even if I'm not invited, I'm coming back. Um, because you rock. So this is my, this is my thing for you. Rumi, who we all know, okay, Rumi, beautiful poet. He used to say, I thought I was clever trying to change the world. Now I am wise because I am trying to change myself. This journey of inclusion is about our personal journeys and our collective journeys. As an Irish singer would say, it's not the wall, it's what's behind it. You stand up, you hold your power, you sing your song, you own your individuality, and collectively together, this inclusion revolution will not be ignored. Rock it! Thank you.